There we go. Hello, everyone. It is Saturday night, and that means it is time for the Weekly Dig. For anyone new to the stream, this is a live show where we dig into anime, old and new. I'm Brent. This is my fabulous co-host, John. Say hi, John. Hi, John. Konbanwa, Mina. O genki desu ka? And we are normally joined by Steve. He cannot join us uh, tonight, sadly. Um, but we will journey along without, nevertheless. He's um, on location, yes. mining the freshest animes <laughs> from the depths of the anime uh, the vein exactly. uh, out there in the world. Well, <laughs> and I feel bad because I, I, I finished watching uh, Cowboy Bebop live action this week. And I'm, I'm looking forward to a good discussion with him about that. Um, because that was definitely a, uh, a trip, uh, a big trip. Um, and, well, and, uh, and after you guys so. have like discussed all that out, my hope is that that will inspire me to then either go find it or be like, aha, I've heard enough. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. so we'll see. It will be. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, full uh, full disclosure. Um, um, I was thoroughly entertained. Are you not entertained? Um, it definitely goes off in its own directions. It is it is more of a remix than an adaptation. Um, yeah. If there's you know they I think what happened was Shinichiro Watanabe came in as consultant and was like here are all of our notes, you know here's all the backstory that we wrote but never actually put into the anime because it was all backstory, and so we get some of that now. Um, Ooh, okay. yes. Uh, uh, John, I think you will be very satisfied with with a lot of the oh that's what happened. Okay, this. good, 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 good. Um, although that also then goes off in different directions, like different different things happen, um, like in the actual plot of the story, uh, and then right. some some things are just changed, like phase, um, um, phase. Her origin is the same, but like like her introduction in, in the show is different. What she's doing is different, stuff along those lines. So, like, her job yeah. is different, that kind of stuff. And then her personalities uh, shift around a little bit. But, uh, yeah, uh, we're like, what I, uh, what I saw, some things I'm like, eh, I wouldn't have done it that way, but fine, fair enough. Right. Um, this is how much the creators of this know their audience. I was watching this with subtitles on. Um, it is, I don't think it's a... Um, uh, it's a spoiler to say that there is a, there's a scene in the live action um, series with Spike walking into a church, like a cathedral. Right. And as he walks in, it starts playing Rain, you know, the song from Battle of Fallen Angels. And the subtitle yeah. is Rain Begins Playing. <laughs> like, just, you know, not sad music, not whatever, just. And now right. that song that you all know that is playing now. It's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All you fan kids, yeah. this is you know you know what's going on, right? Okay, exactly. so, that's very cool. That was that was cool. Um, also, just neat seeing that very distinctive Cowboy Bebop technology. You know, the world. Right. Um, everyone has these sort of rectangular cell phones, like almost like Raspberry Pis, that are like stainless steel mm-hmm. with a screen on them, um, as these sort of cell phones. Um, you know. Th- um, None of the ships have like like really have screens they're piloted off off of. It's all just you know levers and things like that. It's all you know, switches and and things, right? Okay. Like, like you know, Swordfish Two and the Bebop. They, you know, it's all very physical objects. It's not right. touch screens. Um, so it's just kind of neat seeing that realized in live action. But um, and yeah. the rendering of those machines was yeah spot on. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Um. Uh, it all worked. Um. The, the one thing I think that might disappoint folks is that, um, well, vicious, but also, um, I'll I think get back you to and Steve minute. had said that last yeah. week too. I'll go back to that in a minute because <laughs> I have thoughts on there. But um, um, to do it live action, you know, there's no way you can afford to do clamoring through the wreckage of Earth for the old Betamax, you know, yeah. thing for 30 minutes, right? There's just, it's, the, the time and money to like do build all those sets and so forth would be crazy. So it's more like grounded sets, more grounded locations. Um, okay. You still see like the, 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 you know there is a sequence where they go to Earth briefly, stuff like that. You do see it's all trashed, um, but it's it's more um, city streets 
kind of stuff, you know, interiors of spaceships, as opposed to like these big sci-fi locations that you had okay. uh, in the anime. Vicious is done quite differently. Um, in the anime, Vicious is more of a a stereotypical anime villain, right? right? Completely closed off, all that kind of stuff. In this, he's more of a I call him more of a Hong Kong martial arts movie villain. Where he's more over the top, he's more sneering, he's more active, he's more explosively angry, you know, he's more, um, I mean, visibly vicious. Um, right. Uh, in, in, in that emotional way. So there's a lot of acting to the point of overacting in his character, but once you realize that's what they're going for, that he is much more of a... He's in this series almost as much as Spike is. There is oh, a wow, really? lot of vicious in this. Yeah. So I'm oh, interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of spoil this like this almost becomes the the Vicious and Julia show for a while. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. So there's all that going on as well of that whole plot thread, how, you know, what's going on in, in the syndicate and all of that and then and so you get some a little bit more of the of of that side of the story. Now, do you get you get more of Vicious's backstory? Yes. Okay, because oh, that was yes. what I I sorely wanted more of for the the anime, where I'm like, you know, I want to know more about Vicious and what was going on. You will so, get uh, all of that. Um, yeah. Nice. Not to get into a spoiler, you will find out what the rose falling in the puddle means. Yeah, I thought it was Rosebud from Citizen yeah, Kane. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but no, um, that, that's that's <laughs> that's part of a whole scene in a sequence, and now you'll understand like what exactly was happening, what that meant, you know, what was going on. So yeah, so kind of cool. Then again, I think it's cool. kind of the original staff coming back and saying we 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 thought all this out, like we knew where all this was, you know, what all this meant, but that wasn't the point of the anime series. Like we all want all that right. to stay in the background. So now we get it all. So that's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, so Vicious, um, I will also say, I will probably repeat all this when, when Steve comes back too, um, I don't think it's a spoiler, um, at this point, Ed does show up at the very, very end, um, at the very end, very, very end, like literally oh. almost a post-credits teaser reveal of Ed, um, Ed is mentioned throughout the show as a, as a contact that they have. Okay. Um, and by the way, Ed doesn't show up until like episode eight of the TV series. People forget this. Like, it does take him a while to show up in the show. Um, um, but yeah, w- uh, when is when's the data dog thing happen? Um, that's like episode two, I think, two or three of the anime series. Cause, yeah, because I always yeah. every time I see Ein, because yeah. Ed is so yeah. linked mm-hmm. to Ein, yep. it always drags Ed forward <laughs> in my mind into the series. It's like, oh, when we see the data dog. Ed's like shortly there behind. Yeah, no, it's like, it's, yeah, no, actually not. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think that is kind of where they're really going. Is they're like, okay, we're we're hoping we get a season two, and you know, Ed will be part of the the plot in season two. Okay. Um, but Ed is a lot. <laughs> Ed, you know, when, when, the, the the reveal of Ed is kind of overwhelming. So. Um, oh. People are it, it, it's a, people are a little worried, uh, understandably. That Ed might be be really annoying. <laughs> so hopefully that was kind of a well. There's there's extenuating circumstances circumstance of what's going on in the in that sequence. So it could be that that's just kind of you know um, that, that that's not exactly how they're going to play it. Um, but yeah, it's 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 mm. memorable. I'll put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know, hopefully that's the yeah. whole point. Exactly. Is that it, from there it will get better. Mm-hmm. That's just right there. It's memorable. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, and I will say, and Kevin, you, you won't watch the first episode of Bebop Live Action. Um, the first episode of Bebop Live, Live Action is a pretty close remake of episode one of the anime series. Um, so it's Asimov Solonson, it's Red Eye, it's all that plot line. It starts diverging dramatically from that point on. So you start <laughs> getting very different plot. Beyond episode one. So, FYI, because um, um, I watched episode one, and I was like, okay, we're going to get basically, you know, like, re- remakes of ten episodes of the, of the anime series. No. Right. <laughs> um, there are other, other adaptations. And yeah, Ju- Julia looks 
Julia looks very nice. Well, it's it's sort of like you know we've just gone through uh, Evangeline, mm-hmm. that the first film, mm-hmm. you know, it's very yeah. familiar. Yep. And then it starts off, so it, it's got you like, right. oh, okay, I I get how the things work. I get how things are happening here. Yeah. And now we can go off into some uncharted territory and do other things. So yeah. I could I could understand doing that for the live action too, to be like, okay, everybody feel good. We all feel comfortable. We yeah. know where we are now. Now let's go tell a story. <laughs> cool. totally. And by the way, um, and again, without getting into spoilers, um, the end of the season is very much an ending. Like it, oh. it, it does feel like okay if if we stopped here, like this would feel like a coda to everything that's gone on in this season. Um, oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very much so. Um, like the 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 um, th- there's hints at things where things could go, but this very much feels like okay, like we've wrapped up all these plot lines. Um, oh wow! And, okay. uh, we. We know where this could go, but in, in the way of like a, a Castle Cagliostro, where, okay, further adventures may happen, maybe these characters will see each other again, but, right. you know, this is, this is tied in. Um, but, we're not here to talk about Bebop. <laughs> Let us actually start the dig tonight by analyzing an anime movie we both watched this week, Howl's Moving Castle, which, ironically... Um, I watched Toshio Okada's uh, analysis of just today, and he references Castle Cagliostro in his analysis of saying that this is basically what would happen if Clarice decided to go with Lupin um, and go off and be with him and be a thief along with Lupin. This is sort of that, that you know, plot line huh. in Howl's Moving <laughs> okay. Castle, in a way, if you will. If the castle of Cagliostro could move. Right. <laughs> uh, no, not literally, you idiot. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, um, so yeah, Howl's Moving Castle, um, famously um, originally going to be um, uh, Mamoru Hosoda's film debut uh, as he was hired into Studio Ghibli. Um, and then uh, he left... He claims he was fired. Um, Ghibli, um, sorry, Miyazaki says that um, the staff didn't want to work with him, and Suzuki refused to talk about it. So who knows? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what's interesting is uh, Okada does actually show he, he somehow found the, he, Hasoda's storyboards. He storyboarded oh. two thirds of the movie, and he said it in the modern day. So Sophie works in a modern hat shop with, like, cars going by in the oh, thing. Interesting. In the yeah, yeah. Um, and huh. that's interesting, too, because Howl's Moving Castle was, is, um, oh, uh, what does the kind of call it? Um, um, it it's not uh, Ghibli's first, like, misstep in any, any um, real way, but this is really the first time when Ghibli, when the critics were divided on a Ghibli film, where a lot of people just didn't really, you know, get Howl's Moving Castle. I mean, it got, got a fair amount of criticism, right. uh, particularly from the fact that folks were aware of Miyazaki and Fatou Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke, and they, they were, you know, intrigued by this Japanese anime director and he comes out with his very European film. And so, like, a lot of Europeans were like, I'm not really interested in this sort of faux European movie that's kind of a mishmash of European concepts. I'd much rather see something more like Spirit Away, something more Japanese. Right. Um, okay. Which is unfortunate. Um, but yeah, so, so this was originally Hasoda's movie and then re-envisioned by Miyazaki. Um, now, John, what's your, uh, your experience with Howl's Moving Castle? Oh, jeez. Well, this yeah. is the second full watch I've mm. I've done of it for this. Jeez, uh, I think I think it was back in the Netflix days. Wow, okay. That it yeah. was all the stuff that I had not had a chance to see in theaters or see any other any other places. And I watched Princess Mononoke. I watched mm. um, House Moving Castle. I watched yeah. Spirited Away again. I did get to see Spirited Away in the theater, but I watched nice. it again just to see what what I had missed. Mm-hmm. So this is the second time through, okay. and um, I still just uh, critics be damned. It has some fantastic animation. Oh, and I, I don't think anyone disagrees with it. Gorgeous, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. 
It is. And it's like I can look over some of the plot issues by just looking at the depth and luxury of what's going on in these scenes and being like, oh, I just love this. Well, <laughs> that's one of the things that this is a romance story, right? It's it's not yeah. really a war story. It's not really a drama. It's really a romance story. And so I think it's best appreciated that way, um, yeah. where it's, you know, you're not really, I mean, there are, there are certainly layers to the story and other things going on, but it's really more of this, this story of these two people meeting up and falling in love. Um, and yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Um, we talked before, about, uh, and um, yeah, I, I saw it when it came out on DVD, I guess, over here. I didn't see it in theaters, um, but uh, when, it, when it came out, I, uh, I jumped on it and, and saw it, and then rewatched it a few years after that, and this is, I guess, my third viewing. Um, yeah, we talked before about how, um, how careful Miyazaki is in setting things up. Um, yes. And so I love setting this up with Sophie <clears throat> at work. You know, just very industrious, getting, getting work done, just very, very quietly out of the way, kind of subsuming herself into her labors. Um, very much While everybody her. else in the building is having a grand hi-ho good time. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Um, apparently, um, Sasami from Tenchi Moyo, her English voice actress, is one of the teenage girls in here. Um, but I, uh, I have no uh, idea which one because she's not using Sasami's voice. So I, right. yeah. Um, that's kind of a neat thing. Well, one of the things I wish I'd looked up was like the the hat that Sophie's sewing. Oh yeah. It's like the significance of things that she's sewing on it. What in flower language does? Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. My God. Because I'm sure that's entirely <laughs> what's sure. going on right there. <laughs> but I did not uh, did not look up what the flower language yeah. was for what she was sewing. Me neither. Um, but yes, definitely lots of attention to detail. Um, it's yeah. very, you know, otherwise unassuming sort of hat shop. Um, yep. It must also be pointed out that back in the day, um, hat shops were, you know, making hats were known for driving you crazy. Mad as a hatter. Mad as a hatter. Um, so there's a... A little hint there that maybe Sophie is dreaming all of this, right? That maybe she's just been... Too uh, um, much mercury to make the top hats uh, set correctly. Yeah. Oh, okay. So who knows? Um, but yeah, and we get the uh, uh, the train coming through. Uh, the planes... Well, not the planes, but those sort of skimmers flying over. Yeah. Um, lovely stuff. Uh, and then Sophie going around... And, and again, this is kind of Miyazaki showing off of, uh, you know, see how much animation I can, I can command. Yeah. <laughs> just, oh, yeah. Cool. It's just gorgeously done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. It is. Um, and so Sophie walks uh, around. We see all the soldiers. Um, and we see Sophie kind of accosted by two soldiers. And it's like, mm -hmm. Uncomfortable, um, yeah. And this is also where um, you know you, you kind of establish that she's like she's not in her twenties, right? Like she's she's significantly smaller than these guys. Um, so probably you know certainly in her teens. Um, and she was malnourished, just she's well, yeah, still small. Um, so <laughs> probably oh. you know um, um, an adult in the you know eyes of society whether she's you know 21 or not if you will well, um, one of the things that i got when mm -hmm. she's sitting at her workbench and she looks up and mm -hmm. the train's about to come by there's an awful lot of anna green gables kind of facial expression on oh, her at like yeah. certain points absolutely and her slim structure mm -hmm. is very reminiscent of anna green gables as is her dress I mean, just yeah. that is very much an Anna Green Gables, you know. Yeah. That, that so it's like I, yep. I got a I got a lot of vibe out of that, where it's yeah. like, okay, it might not just be that she's necessarily fifteen, which I'm sure she is, mm -hmm. yeah. but that she's also got this kind of waifish yeah. kind of aesthetic that's uh, that seems to have drawn from other subject matter, perhaps. Absolutely. Was... Sort of like the Ghibli mustache, right. here, <laughs> or nose, or facial structure, or any of that. We will definitely get some noses in this anime in this movie. Oh yes, we will. <clears throat> Uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. almost spirited away noses. Really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, and it should be pointed out, you know, to that point, you know, there's that that classic sort of European aesthetic, the the yeah. Heidi, um, you know, Anne is obviously Canadian, but still, um, 
uh, definitely uh, we see that here as well. British Canadian. British Canadian, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so she, she's accosted by these soldiers, and of course Howell shows up um, to kind of rescue her. And there is a detail here, which I'm going to see if I can see. Yeah, I can. Um, so it's really hard to see in here, but you'll notice when Howell puts his hand on, his sh on her shoulder, his, her, uh, his ring glows. Oh. Because as we find out later... She has mana. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, this is not his first time meeting Sophie. Right? Exactly. And his magic knows that. So it's resonating with that. Like, ah. um, I don't think he recognizes her, but I think the magic is kind of resonating there. Um, that, that's kind of a cool little detail. Um... Uh, yeah, and then off they go on a uh, lovely thing. I remember watching this the first time and thinking, wow, Miyazaki is totally doing Mishonen. Like, Howl is absolutely, like, you know, he, you know, he should be in a, in a, a singing group with a bunch of other pretty men, uh, you know, in, in a TV <laughs> anime series, you know, making, making girls' hearts uh, explode. Um, I mean, he's well. He's that's the backstory wise. that we're supposed to like uh, yes, know mm -hmm. just somehow. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. his idle days behind him. <laughs> he's decided to do dedicate himself to warlockery. Yeah. Oh, cool, <laughs> neat. And Marco will be, you know, the the, the backup singer, right? And then, uh, uh, what was it? Plat Platinum End. What was that thing we mm. watched? That had all the vampire like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> boy band. <laughs> he's on. He's broken he's, away. He's doing a uh, solo career now. He's away from Platinum people, whatever. <laughs> Oh, joyous! Um, the Justin Timberlake of Wizards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, yeah, and so Sophie goes to her sister, meets with her, um, and we get a little bit of backstory about wizards and witches being no bueno in this world. Yeah. Um, I do. I do like the little little thing where, uh, um, like, her manager comes in and says, uh, "You can use my office." And she goes, "No, I need to get back to work." And then they like. Go and hide somewhere. <laughs> yeah. The, gotcha. No, you you just need to not be in his office. Understood. Um. Uh, and uh, um, yeah. So you have all that. Um, and then you get introduced to the wonderful Blob Men, um, <laughs> which are just such classic Ghibli style. You know, weird antagonistic creatures yeah um, and you know what they reminded me vaguely of mm. I, 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 no, yeah. no connection whatsoever the princess and the frog mm. dr facier facier yeah um that kind of like voodoo kind of oh like yeah. New Orleans -ish yeah, yeah yeah kind of mm -hmm. um ethic uh, yeah it, 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 top hat mask have. absolutely totally yeah yeah and i mean it's like this is like a funeral march, like a Creole Louisiana, like funerary march with these things. Yep. I'm like, oh, that's funky. She's mm -hmm. like a voodoo black magic kind of lady. Yeah. I'm like, gotcha. Yeah, huh? totally. Um, it should also be pointed out, one of the things is um, um, she's in this carriage with these, these black curtains. Um, yeah. the and she only shows up like inside things. So clearly, like light is a problem for her. She's like keeping away from the light in the darkness. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, Sophie comes home um, and of course um, the Witch of the Wastes appears um, in her full self. All yeah. 500 pounds of her. <sighs> yeah. Oh. Um, she's, a, she's a lot of lady. She's a lot of lady. <laughs> Absolutely. But a lovely lady. Definitely. Um, definitely glamorous. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and terrifying. And terrifying. Awesome. Absolutely. And to that point, like, I really love how they get across the fact that these witches and wizards are terrifying. Like, people do not want to deal with them. They, they, they respect them at very least and fear them at, at, at very worst. And there is this sense of, get away from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, and it's interesting, too, that here we have this, you know, very mm. 1910s, 1920s, yeah. somewhere in there, uh, technology kind of world with flying machines and mm -hmm. vehicles and all this stuff. And there's witches and, witches and wizards, yeah. of which we only know of 
two. <laughs> well, we'll <laughs> like we'll get more of those, more than that. But yes. Yeah, um, I mean, we do, we find out with Solomon that there's more, mm-hmm. but it's like we don't, you know. Yeah. Actually, we don't even see the what we hear later on. Like, mm-hmm. oh, those are people that have given over right. to their uh, baser instincts. Mm-hmm. We never get to see them as like people. Right. We only ever see them as the monsters they become. And right. it's like so. There's obviously a big thing going on, but mm-hmm. backstory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> a little bit of backstory. We um, um, no, no backstory for you. No. I have to know it already. Right. <laughs> to have done my homework um, before I saw the film. And I'm glad you brought that up um, about the, the, the time period. Um, Miyazaki had said going into this that there were, there were a couple of um, um, books that he had always wanted to like, adapt into, um, uh, into or use as inspiration for film. And they were these, these, and I forget the titles, but they're these very sort of Jules Verne-esque illustrations of kind of 20th century technology kind of reimagined as flying machines and so forth and so on. So he's pulling from a lot of that too. And this is clearly viewpoint said to be like World War One, you know, era. Um, right. Just with those those things kind of worked in. Um, in their little Austro-Hungarian town. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, um, uh, in fact, Toshio Kata thinks this, this takes place in, um, is it Alsace-Lorraine? That, the, the, that uh, okay, um, yeah. The French-German... You know, like between yes. France and Germany, yeah. Um, the the uh, Franco-Prussian War, eighteen seventy, mm-hmm. the province got taken by the Germans, yeah. and they defeated the French, mm-hmm. and the French were salty about it. <laughs> so after the First World War got done, France was like, "Yoink, thank mm-hmm. you, yeah. <laughs> taking that back." Um, you definitely see German on all like the posters, but yeah. like there's a lot of French like influence too of just fashions and so forth. So. Yeah, the, uh, the the soldiers themselves that accost mm. Sophie kind of remind me of like the Zoabs. Mm. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, the red and the blue, the very mm. flashy uniforms. Yeah. Very French. Yep. Um, and so Sophie, of course, is cursed, um, becomes an old woman. Um, and uh, not much to say about that. She kind of goes to bed. Um, and then well, it's a really interesting mm. point, too, because all you've seen is. How save her, yeah. Sophie, from the soldiers pestering her. Mm-hmm. And then he says, hey, you know, stay, stay on this ledge, I'll be back. And she ends up, you know, talking to her sister and all yeah. this other stuff happens. And it's like, okay, for as far as we know at this stage of the film without doing the homework, yeah. Sophie doesn't know him from a bar of soap. And it's exactly. amazing, miraculous things, you know, flying over the city doing all mm-hmm. nuts. And then this witch shows up and curses her. Yeah, <laughs> it's like okay. When you watch to the end of the film, it's like oh, okay, I understand what how this fits with what's going on. But at the moment, it's like, what does the witch of the waste just like knock on random doors? So, be like, hi, I'm gonna curse you. So, <laughs> like, O'Connor brought this up. He said, imagine watching the Castle Cagliostro entirely from Clarice's perspective, where you know, girl runs from convent, drives away. Random thief shows up and rescues her in her car. She gets taken back to the castle. Um, her teacher th- throws her clothes off and turns out to be a mercenary. The thief shows up again, <laughs> rescues her, and then she's kidnapped again, um, is forced to take a pill. She wakes up to watch the thief get like exploded in front of her. And then she's rescued. It's like, what's going on? You know? Yeah. A little mind bending. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that is very much kind of the, the experience of this movie, is we're seeing everything from Sophie's perspective, despite the fact there's clearly lots of history between all these characters, and there's yeah. lots of stuff going on. Yeah, agreed. Like I said, once, once you've seen the entirety of the film, what the Witch of the Waste is doing absolutely makes sense. Yeah. You know, and it's like, it's just, at this moment, it's like, wow, rando curse. Uh, just <laughs> handing them out in the, in the public square. Hey, you, nice hat, you're <laughs> cursed. How about you? Oh, those are great looking shoes, you're cursed. <laughs> like, <dang>. Well, <laughs> and I think it sets up an interesting tension in the film that, that by doing this, you don't know if witches and wizards are just crazy. Yeah. If they just kind of go around doing this randomly, or if there is a, a method to their madness, if you will. Right. Um, and we do find out later, oh, no, these, these are all, you know, there's all cause and effect in all of this. Right. Um, but, yeah, it does. Well, I mean, the Witch of the Waste, she comes off being just dripping with, with uh, luxuriant evil. Yeah. Not crazy. Mm-hmm. Not unbalanced. No. Completely cool, yep. level-headed, and just 
is it dripping with evil? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, so it's, it's a really, you know, it's, it's an interesting take on, <laughs> on like how witches and wizards are. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And so, uh, then we get to, to meet Sophie's mother, um, who is, who, um, a bit much. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, her sister, you know, yeah. really looks like their mother. Mm -hmm. Sophie, not so much, oddly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, we never see her father. I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming she takes more after her father, physically. Um, well, this is this is not Disney, so the mother's alive and the father's right, dead. There we are, yeah. <laughs> oh. God, makes God. total sense now. Um, yeah, I do love the, the battleship hat. That is just, <laughs> you know, Miyazaki being a little, little over the top there. Um, although I just noticed it's a, it's a Tormekian shield, I think, on the, on the plume, that little, uh, like, orange thing. I think oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. see that in Nazca somewhere. Anyway, um, Interesting. Yeah. I thought it was like it's literally a, a medieval helmet visor kind of uh, could be. thing. Yeah. It was like, I don't yeah. know. I'll have to look. Um, with cannons. Yeah. <laughs> And again, flowers, because they are, you know, you get a good look at that hat. Mm -hmm. There's a reason there's flowers. Are yeah. they doing whatever the mm -hmm. language of flowers means? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are the thing. Yep. Again, you did your homework. We know what it is. <laughs> Don't do your homework. You have no idea. No, no, definitely not. Um, and so, yeah, and so Sophie decides to leave because uh, she's embarrassed. She doesn't know what's going on. And I will admit, this is my point watching the movie where I started getting a little annoyed or a little frustrated with the movie, um, because in con so until this point, William Miyazaki's career, his protagonists tend to be very clearly directed. Um, you know, there, there's something they're trying to accomplish, something they're trying to do, or something that they're like clearly running away from, um, or right. trying to explore and learn and so forth and so on. And Sophie just kind of wanders off. <laughs> um, she doesn't really have anything to do. She doesn't really have any any direction. She has no. She hasn't the first idea where to start clearing this curse. Right. Um, and so Which, I mean, off. that's about the only thing you have for it. Yeah. Is, sh you know, she's got to figure out what to do about the curse. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, she's, you know, uh, obviously she's 90 years old. So she's not, you know, there's not a hot minute where she's running down the street screaming, how, where are you? Or which, where are you? Yeah. So she's proceeding <laughs> at a leisurely old person <laughs> pace. Um, but you don't get a real sense of like, critical mission yeah mm -hmm. you know and it's like are, is that the are you trying to emphasize the fact that now she's 90 mm. so that even though she still mentally should be like mm. a teenage girl are you trying to emphasize that no once you're just made to be 90 now you start to think of things like oh i should get some cheese and put that in a bag mm. and i should get some bread and like you get easily yeah. distracted and you mm -hmm. sort of wander away and it's like so you're trying to give us a realistic representation of an older person who is trying to set out on a mission, but kind of doesn't have the mental acuity to do it. <laughs> like, uh, it's confusing, yeah. honestly. I mean, it is, it is, it's a weird kind of thing with her. <laughs> it is. Um, and I, th so I think kind of part of the charm of the movie is that our protagonist doesn't have that drive um, and is just kind of taking life as it comes to her. Um, as, you know, uh, definitely different than what we see in a lot of, of, of traditional films. It's not Princess Mononoke, that's for damn sure. No, true. it's definitely not that. Hmm. Um, it is, uh, um, well, it is, it's more of a Mamoru Hosoda film, right? Like, a yeah. lot of his protagonists certainly have things they're trying to accomplish, but they're more just kind of, you know, reacting to things as opposed to having this, right. I must accomplish this thing. So, it's interesting. Um... Yeah, so then she, she rescues uh, Turniped, of course. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I love> Turniped. <laughs> um, uh, With no particular, you know, we've just seen her get cursed. She knows mm -hmm. that this witch cursed her. Yeah. And here is a jumping scarecrow. <laughs> Should that not also be like a moment of, ah, <laughs> you know? <laughs> nope. It's cool about it. Oh, what are you doing upside down in there? Here you go. It's like, thanks, Grandma. Well, there is, I think, also kind of an aspect of now that she's in the wastes, I, I, I wonder if she's like, this is just going to happen from now on. Like, this is just what to expect. <laughs> There's going to be crazy things every minute here. Yeah. 
should probably be careful, like sitting on rocks because they'll talk. Mm, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So off she goes, and of course, Turner Ped um, shows up, um, and we have this moment again. I'll see if I can I can uh, freeze frame it because he shows up um, and uh, offers her something, and we spend a moment on this thing. Yes, we do. Um, it is a cane with a bird's head. Yep. And, what and where Howell did he get the cane? Exactly. And what is where Howell does Turnip Howell? Head find it? A bird. Mm-hmm. So, Ish. Yeah, yeah. Flying creature, maybe. <laughs> okay, yes, that's, yeah, that's probably the best yes. way to put it. Yeah, I'm a bird. Um, and so when Howl's Moving Castle shows up, and Sophie goes in, the implication is she's able to go through because he found a totem that sort of matches how. Um, and that's what allows her to go in, um, is that she has something magical that kind of gets her in. Because we never see that cane again for the rest of the movie, as far as I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, also the question, you know, is how is that? How did you get in? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like just sort of left there. It's like, well, I'm your cleaning lady. Like, no, yeah. <laughs> Not that's works. great. <laughs> yeah, that's that's super. But that's not the question here. How the hell did you get into a walking magical castle? Um, so, I gotta call ADT. That security yeah, system is yeah, trash. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then she goes, um, where we meet uh, Billy Crystal, aka Calcifer, <laughs> um, who does a fine job. I will, I will, I will say, um, as a little fire demon. Um, um, and we have this, uh, this, again, kind of interesting conversation because immediately Calcifer tries to make a deal. Yep. And we all know what that means <laughs> in fairy tales. Mm-hmm. And Sophie ends up agreeing as she falls asleep. Um, and she's with this wonderful little bit of, uh-oh, that's going to come back to haunt everyone in this story. Well, it's interesting, too, because, like, making the deal, where's, like, the contract signed in blood or signed in fire? It's like, no, it's just kind of like a handshake, kind of, not even a handshake. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of, eh. Well, and um, it's it's one of the fun things is, uh, and you see this also in Tales of Mercy, which is, you know, um, it's much more like hedge magic. Right? It's much more this, this um, sort of informal magic, if you will, as yeah. opposed to... I will recite these words and do these things, and that the, there's this Vancean sort of magic system that's very controlled and defined. As Zhang Li would say, Li Wei is a city of contracts. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is not Li Wei. No, it's very much not. Very informal. <laughs> very informal. Well, um, and it, and for that point too, it's like it gives you it gives you a a sense of foreboding, mm-hmm. but you're not quite sure how to deal with it yeah. because there isn't. A contract signed in blood and fire. Right. It's like, so you have no idea when she's like, uh uh-huh, sure. Mm-hmm. You don't, at this moment, no. It's like, what kind of what terrible things are going to happen? Yep. What, you know, how, <laughs> how could agreeing to this lead to, like, complete catastrophe? And, and again, you know, seeing it in Tyler and Zoe's perspective, right? Like, she, she has no context for yeah. what any of this, this is, how, how normal this is. Do witches and wizards just sort of make deals with each other informally and has no binding aspect whatsoever? Could be. Um, and again, in a world that has witches and, and wizards, we don't even know. Is there like primary school education? Be like two plus two is four, and if a familiar of a witch or wizard asks you for a contract, you should always say no. Right. <laughs> it's like we have no idea. You know, mm-hmm. on long practical terms, as a hat maker. She may never have learned about don't agree to things, don't yep. do this. So, you know, and it might have been just sort of a naive attack. She doesn't yep. know. Sure. Whatever, Cal. Yeah. Whatever. Man, that's fine. Yeah. Very sheltered life. Yeah. Um, so, yes. And then you get the uh, very not inspired by actual Japanese history shots of all of the battleships going off into the, the ocean. Um, yeah. With all the people waving and cheering for all the battleships to, to go off. Um, um, all the castle in the sky turrets and stuff yeah, and, uh, <laughs> oh, like uh, there we go uh, uh, <clears throat> I will get back to castle in the sky um, um, but yeah she, she wakes back up um, to see Marco come in um, 
and, uh, and and reveal stuff. And, and again, this is I think Miyazaki doing a good job of of storytelling, where you see them use the door, um, and people coming into the door, and then just you know, turning the knob, and then what? something else happens. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, oh, okay, I get it now. Wait, now you just yeah. show it to me, and I understand how all that works. Um, really fun. Um, also, I literally just noticed that. Um, Calcifer's uh, fire pit area looks just like right. the front of the castle. That that mouth. The mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay. That that makes sense. Um, well, that you know, he, since he controls, and presumably yep. he controls the construction of the yeah, castle. Yeah, I think. Mm-hmm. So that he's you know almost it's like eh, this is your fireplace. So you kind of just replicated the front of this. It's easy. Mm-hmm. It looks the same. Yeah. In this absolute disaster zone <laughs> of a room. Oy. Um, yeah, and again, I love how casual they are about it. They're like, nobody mentions... I mean, Sophie goes, boy, what a dump. Um, yeah. But Mark is just going around, yeah, they'll throw this in the book, whatever, you know. And <laughs> uh, This is just what life is. Yeah, invitation from the king. I'll just throw it in this big rando book amongst all these scrolls and other trash. There we go. And you like, say, oh. bachelor pad? Yeah, kind of. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Um, there's stuff everywhere. Um, and then... Uh, Can you say a hoarder's uh, yeah. nest and uh, <laughs> some some terrible sense of order? <laughs> a little sure. bit. A little bit. Um, uh, yeah, and so... Um, uh, and then, then we get to see uh, that wonderful shot of uh, the uh, this other kingdom um, with all of the uh, cars driving around. Yeah, um, and this is actually one of one of the hints is um, there appears to have been a um, um, some kind of split. So, so the implication here is that one kingdom is technological um, and has like you know uh, uh, horseless carriages, while the the other kingdom has like a bunch of wizards and, and witches working for them, um, as we'll see see later on. So there there appears to be this sort of um, split in, in direction um, between the two kingdoms. And almost like the one that has the cars is more like a land kingdom, mm-hmm. and the other one is more like a kingdom that has a really good navy. Mm. Hmm. Huh. Doesn't sound familiar at all. I have no idea what you're talking no, about. No, <laughs> not in the least. Yeah. How odd. Uh, Wizards and witches and, you know, sort of natural occurring and magic and a fleet, mm-hmm. and then a very technologically land-based power, probably without so much natural oh, really. magic, etc. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Uh. Yeah. And so. Um. Yeah. And so here, um, Sophie uh, first begins to sort of tame Calcifer, um, which opens up our first kind of hint, uh, as we were talking about beforehand, is that clearly Sophie has some kind of magical affinity. Yeah. Um, there's there's some you know, she clearly doesn't fear this stuff I and mean, she has some reservations like some natural you know like this stuff is dangerous yeah fire bad <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, where's Steve when we eat him fire right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> damn it pit. Steve um, uh, but when it comes to like interacting just kind of getting on with it okay let's just get on with it and, and do what needs to be done um, uh, and well it, to, and certainly to your point this is like a magical creature yeah and you don't just throw a frying pan on a magical <laughs> creature unless you've got some ability to have it not kill you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like she might not understand the full context of this, but just the physicality of her yeah. throwing that on Calcifer mm-hmm. shows that she has some element of mastery yeah. to be able to do that in the first place almost, and not be burned alive. Almost like she named him. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Weird. What which, what do, which what do we know about from Natsumi's Book of Friends? Mm. That when you name things, you possess things. Yeah. And it's like, ah, interesting. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so she, she gets along with making uh, breakfast. Uh, and then in comes and Howell. Boy, bacon, holy cow. Bacon and eggs. Bacon and eggs. Thank you. Um, oh boy! And, and yeah, but that bacon's like and, half a yeah, pig. That's, I'm like, oh, cow. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's a lot of bacon. That's English bacon. That's like, you know, yeah. Here you go. Um, did you ever watch um, um, 
the BBC adaptation of um, oh gosh, um, oh the, the the veterinarian story. Um, all creatures great and small. All creatures great and small with yeah. Peter Davidson. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, I don't know if you ever saw the episode where he like delivers somebody's calf, and they and they, they invite him in for breakfast, and they have these giant slabs of bacon that are like eighty nine percent fat. Oh boy! And he's just like, I've been up all night, like I, I okay, you know, and they're just giving him like slice after slice after slice, and he's just like, ah, ah. <laughs> but that's the kind of breakfast yep, that'll stick exactly with right. you. <laughs> like, it'd kill you ultimately, but that's not important. Here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, Gosh, I had, uh, no. I had not thought of that show in I don't even know how long. Yeah, yeah. Because I used, I, my my mother used to watch the heck out of that show, and then I ended up seeing parts of it too. Mm-hmm. But uh, back yeah. to anime. Back to anime. Um, probably my first introduction to a a Doctor Who actor. That I think. That was your first introduction to Peter Davidson? Yeah, I think so. Um, oh, damn. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it aired on PBS when I was when I would have been, you know, 8 or 10 or something like that. So yeah. Probably before Doctor Who came along. But anyway. Uh, or at least before Doctor Who, like, you know, aired in my local region. Anyway, we're not here to talk about Doctor Who. We're here to talk about... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're we're, we're off on the tangent, yes. yes. <laughs> um, um, so, so Hal shows up exhausted. Um, but still gorgeous. But still gorgeous. <laughs> And, and again, I think, you know, um, effective storytelling with Miyazaki, where it's like, Howell doesn't say anything, she doesn't say anything, we're just left to wonder. Yeah. Um, you know, and it is not the kind of movie where it's like, what happened? Well, I was out doing X, Y, Z. Like, that's not what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but he take. I mean, given that he doesn't necessarily, now she's in a format that he doesn't necessarily recognize either, mm-hmm. he's still very chill about yes. this lady cooking in his house. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, he's 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 pretty fearless, frankly. Appear uh, apparently, yeah. Um, she kind of rolls with it, um, but there's you do get that implication that well, if Calisfer let her in, you know, and clearly she's not here to you know destroy anything. That okay, we'll we'll see where this goes. This, this doesn't appear immediately dangerous. Um. It should also and be presumably he's confident enough in his own powers, right, I guess, exactly. as well, that he um, can handle it. What's also interesting is that every witch and wizard that we see is supremely confident. True. And Sophie is not. Like, she is just, I mean, she's obviously, she has confidence in herself. But like, when he comes in, she's looking around, she's trying to figure out what's going on. So she's not carrying herself the way the witches and wizards typically do. So that might also right. be kind of that. Um, but, uh, yes, in, in goes the eggs and the, and the bacon, and we all get very hungry. Um, um, and, uh, the spell shows up that the, the Witch of the Wastes left for her, um, in this lovely bit of, of fantastical, um, just ledger domain, um, of the, you know, the paper disappearing, and then the seal appearing on the table. Yeah. Um, and... We get another little hint of Howl, his personality, as he rubs off the thing, burning his hand, and smiles while doing it. Yeah. Which, I mean, he knows that Sophie has it in her pocket. Because mm-hmm. he says, <laughs> what's in your pocket? <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's such an interesting character element of him, mm-hmm. where he knows that that's not really a big super threat to him. He can take care of it. Right. But, you know what I mean, he still went through the the drama of having it occur versus just literally reaching into Sophie's pocket, crumpling it up and, you know, having it burst in his hand and then be done. It's like, no, there's a little bit of little theater here. It's funny. Now that you say that, a certain book came to my mind while I was watching this movie. I was like, no. Necronomicon? Now that you mentioned that, The Hobbit. Sophie is turned out of her home and goes out wandering in the wilderness. She's okay. kind of miserable out there. And then she meets this wizard, um, uh, this very powerful wizard who's very self-confident. And then what does he ask her? What have you got in your pocket? Oh, wow. Right, you know? 
Just saying. <laughs> Sophie as Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> yeah, kind of. There, there's, there's again. I don't think it's like a one to one thing, but it is odd how many like little. Oh, that is interesting. In there, and uh, Marco turning into sort of a dwarf. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Given rings? given the vast uh, element of, uh, of uh, Miyazaki's <laughs> readings and. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not impossible that that stuck somewhere in the back yeah. of his mind. <laughs> it will be. Um, Captain Laser Eyes asks, is how a human or some kind of bird demigod thing? Um, it's a fair question. The implication, I think, in the movie is that he is human, but by becoming a wizard, especially at such a young age, um, he definitely has extremely powerful powers um, yes. that makes him, you know, um, almost beyond human, if you will. Um, demigod. Demigod. <laughs> Um, with with a, with a bird being his sort of natural wizard form, kind of, sort of, um, kind of what he seems to revert to when he does that. I don't know. Um, but yes, so um, uh, Sophie decides to start cleaning up. Um, nearly kills Calcifer. I think it's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, as she's cleaning out the ash. Um, and I do love how Howell deals with that. Um, how he he comes in and in a very pleasant voice, you know, turns to Sophie and says, I'd appreciate it if you didn't torture my friends. Yeah. Um, just completely putting Sophie in her place in a way that doesn't feel like an attack. Right. Um, but that just feels like, this is what you did. Don't do that anymore. But I, I understand where your heart was coming from. You know? Yeah. Well, it's also interesting, too, to think about the, um, Calcifer can drive this castle. Mm-hmm. He, you know what I mean? There's, there's magic afoot here. Yeah. And you can kill him by literally just letting the wood run out <laughs> yeah. or, or throwing water on it. Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's a very powerful, but enormously weak, <laughs> you know, magical creature. You're yeah. like, wow. Which I think is, is again, kind of a, a hint at a lot of the things we see here is that, um, yeah, clearly all these magical things have weaknesses. Um, yeah. You know, we see later that um, the wizard, which of the waste weakness is light. Um, yeah. You know, um, Howl's weakness, I'm not sure what Howl's weakness actually is, but I'm sure we can figure it out. Um, perhaps it's love. Oh, I no. think it's love. Yeah. Um, What's Suleiman's weakness then? That's a really good question. Um, I think it might also be love. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, um, she definitely um, was weak to Howl. Um, mm-hmm. It's implied he's put her in that wheelchair. Mm. Um, um, I do find it um, uh, again sort of a, a neat hint here that when she opens the uh, the bathroom, um, oh yeah, <laughs> it's not just grimy; it's covered in color. <laughs> yeah, it's just spattered everywhere, and it's that hint that oh, it's it's hair dye. As, as we see later. Um, and it's, you know, all sorts of, you know, weird color, it obviously pigment, you know, perfumes or whatever. Um, but that, uh, there's a lot more going on here. I, I love also there's a toothbrush just like right in there. Like, what the heck? Yeah. Um, well, so all I can envision is like his rock star kind of thing where it's got his hair dying in the sink and then he does like the Fabio flip where he exactly. stands up and goes, whip! <laughs> and it just splatters on the wall and he's like, I look fabulous! And he walks out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, because that bathroom is, oh, uh, boy. <laughs> the first time you see it, it's like, oh, jeez. Yeah. yeah, the water in the bathtub is gray. Just... Yeah, like, oof. And which, again, is kind of a hint as to what's been going on with him outside. Um, that, you know, he, he's, he's covered in soot, right? Like, it's, yeah. it's, he's, he's getting really dirty, not just getting refreshed. Um, yeah, this is not one of those where it's like, okay, the bath is ready. I'll start first, then you go yeah, after me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Thanks, no. no. We're going to have to waste water here, Hal. I hate to break the news to you. <laughs> exactly. I do find it... Uh, uh, it's an interesting comment where Hal's like hot water cows for, and he's like, again, and it's just like, is making hot water rather than driving an entire mobile <laughs> castle is that that much harder? <laughs> like, apparently, um, it, it, it's a, it's a burden. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And so, um, let's see here, is this the scene where, yes, and so here is where, um, I think it's the first time you see it, yeah, where she then walks out um, onto the balcony, and it's the first time she's not hunched over. Ah. And this is the first time where we start to realize that, you know, her curse is not exactly, you know, just old age. Right. Um, because her old age fluctuates quite a bit over the course of this movie. Um, as she is kind of coming out of herself and not, not thinking about herself now, she's just experiencing this thing and it kind of cuts a few uh, years off of her. Yeah, I, I found that kind of interesting. And I was, I was trying to figure out the, the rationale for it where it's like sometimes she looked like a woman in her 50s. Mm -hmm. And then other times she looked like a woman yeah. in her 90s. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, why is she fluctuating? What are the things going on around her that she fluctuates yeah. her physical appearance? And I'm like, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, it, it, as far as I can tell, it appears to be the more she is focused on herself and her own problems, the older she is. And the more she focuses on other things and other people's problems and so forth, the younger she is. Um, oh, interesting. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, and then beautiful. Which would kind of make a lot of sense considering the Witch of the Waste thinks mm -hmm. a lot of herself. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that she would curse somebody and be like, hey, every time you think of yourself and you're self involved, mm -hmm. you get older. Yep. <laughs> like, ooh. Totally makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, so they, 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 turn up head again. Turn up head. <laughs> Um, it gets caught like the weirdest place. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then uh, they do the laundry. Um, this is a neat thing that uh, Okada mentioned, which I had not noticed. Um, and we'll see if we can get a shot of it. Um, because they mentioned that Turnip Head um, uh, enjoys doing laundry. Um, that's not exactly accurate. Um, because... When he uh, does that, and you see him, uh, oh well. Oh, well. Um, when you see him, oh, there it is. Uh, 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 there we are. Um, he's not looking at the laundry. He's looking at the mountains. The mountains that are the border between this country and the next country. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, Giving a hint of where he might be from. Exactly. Yeah. Perhaps. Perhaps. Um, uh, yeah, and then we see how flying around, fighting airships, um, as you do in a Miyazaki movie, basically. Um, cool fight scene, though. Um, with all yeah. these sort of bat creatures and flying around those. Um, and, and Dresden. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, uh, and then in he comes in sort of bird form. Um, and starts returning, and here's where Calcifer kind of gives, gives the audience that hint of, oh, if you do this too much or go too far, you cease to become a human. Um, Which is that, at the point the bat creatures come out, is that, yeah. do they make that point at that time about who the bat creatures are? Uh, it's later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and here's where we get that revelation. Because he comes in and he looks at Sophie sleeping. And she's 15 again. Yeah. Um, and there's, yeah, again, kind of the, okay, this is, this is a more complicated curse. Because um, when she's, you know, she's asleep, she's not thinking of anything. Right. Um, and we know that Howell knows that. Presumably. Um, and I just realized... Does Howell now recognize her? So later in the movie, we know that, like, you know, she sees him briefly. Yeah. Kind of the way she looks now. Is this where he puts two and two together? I don't know. Well, it's definitely a long stare. Yeah. But, geez, yeah, I mean, it's not really quite enough to be like, yeah. oh, yeah, it clicked finally. Mm -hmm. I, and probably Miyazaki's intentionally leaving it vague of saying, you decide, audience. Um, I've is, given you the tools, now do the work. Exactly. Man, yeah. come on. Um, 
and so uh, out they go, and now we see the uh, the the battleship limping back to port. Um, <sighs> and by the way, this is actually kind of an important thing for later, um, because one of the criticisms of the film is that um, uh, Solomon is like, well, let's stop the war, right? Let's just well, let's just end this silly war. No, it ain't going well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because only one boat that we see. We saw uh, like you know yeah. at least a string of ships going out. So it's yeah. kind of like you lost everything except for that one. <laughs> yeah. like, uh huh. Um, so yeah, the, the, the war is not a uh, is not dragging on. It appears um, events have not developed to the to the, <laughs> to the prosperity yeah. of the nation. Um, Events have not necessarily progressed in a direction entirely favorable to the nation, I believe. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, and I think that totally fits this moment, yeah, right? Absolutely, here. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and to back they come, um, Howell has his wonderful little pretty boy freak out moment um, where he's horrified by his, his red hair, which again, a little bit of Anne of Green Gables, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. You know the, the red hair, um, mm-hmm. and, and it also should be pointed out like there is there is also like the whole sequence in Anne of Green Gables where she dyes her hair green, and freaks out because yeah that's a whole thing where she she uh, uh, okay tangent um, <laughs> in the book and the anime um, a man shows up on their doorstep going door to door selling little like bottles of things and like this is this guaranteed hair dye that will make your hair raven black. Um, and so Anne buys one and turns out it's snake oil, right? He's just a snake oil salesman. Um, and, uh, it, it dyes her hair a, a, a rather bright green. Um, <laughs> wow. of course, she does this, does this without telling Marilla at all because she's like, oh, you know, you know, Marilla might, you know, I, I'll just take care of it. Marilla's like out in town or something. Um, and so, and, and of course, e- even better, you know, Anne being Anne, you know, she starts to dye it and looks at it. So she has, you know, two thirds red haired and like one third green. Oh. <laughs> so the scissors come out. Um, yeah, but uh, she does not run over to Diana's and be like, "Help!" <laughs> oh no, 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 no. Um, she, she. She informs Diana and swears her to secrecy. And Diana and Marilla and Anne are the only ones who ever know what happened. <laughs> they, just, they refuse to ever talk about it to anyone ever. Um, Even Matthew doesn't know? No. Nope. Oh, wow. Nope. She okay. Just, just, Anne decided to cut her hair. You know, <laughs> it, it was, they just decided to do that. <laughs> to a, a, a nice spring bob. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um... Uh, yeah, and then things go poorly, uh, shall we say? Yeah. Um, as Howell begins to melt. Um, and again, just lovely, fantastical kind of stuff here. Um, this is what we watch fantasy movies for, is uh, visuals like this, of just weird, yeah. creepy goop falling off this person because of, of what's going on. Um, well, I love that it's animated so well, you get a sense of the viscousness yeah. when she touches him, where it's just kind of like, Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, I kind of got that sensation right there watching it. Like, oh, jeez. Mm-hmm. Totally. It's like touching a frog. It's like <laughs> gone all weird. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, so Sophie runs away for a moment. Which, again, I think in a lot of other movies, um, you, you could see this as being a, kind of a, a, a movie um, about being middle-aged. Um, or about being older, even, um, of dealing with age in general. Um, you know, Howell arguably is going through sort of a, a midlife crisis at the moment. Um, and uh, Sophie obviously is dealing with, with age as well. And so this is the kind of moment that you would not expect of a classic sort of anime hero or heroine, of just you know, right. running out at the crisis and then kind of standing there in the rain. But it is a very natural human reaction of just... I'm done with this. I can't stand here anymore. Um, but then by the time you get a few steps outside, you're like, I can't, I just can't leave this. I, this, no, I can't bring myself to do it. Um, uh, and I just do love the, uh, the, the very human aspect of that. 
Um, and so, of course, they, you know, they resolve this by giving him a bath. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, and then the summons come in. Oh, and then we, we get to Howell's bedroom. Um, his rather busy bedroom. Yeah. Oh. Fantastical bedroom. Very <laughs> much so. Um, and again, I think it, it, this is where you get kind of that hint that of, of how being kind of childish. Um, that he just, like, he loves beauty. He loves collecting beautiful little objects. Um, and that's just what he's, what he's done here. Um, and I know they're all fantastical in one way, shape, or form. Um, right. There's always something kind of weird about them. Um, well, I was, you know, it wasn't ever going to happen because the room was so chock-a-block full yeah. of crap. Um, but I, you know, watching it, I'm like, are these all like charms right. or something? Yeah. Are they like, mm -hmm. is this like part of how Howl kind of keeps himself away from Sullivan? Mm -hmm. How he keeps himself sort of like ducking out yeah. when he when he needs to? That all these things they do stuff, yeah. but it's like we call. never we never get any kind of information about it. So I'm gonna guess the homework would say right. perhaps <laughs> exactly. Well, I know when she walks in. Um, there's a little, there's an eye on the door, uh, that like closes. Let's see if we can see it. Um, not sure. The evil eye? Uh, there it is. Um, and like when she closes the door, the eye kind of moves a little bit as she comes in. Um, so probably a charm there, keeping an eye on things, yeah. you know, literally. Um, uh, but yeah. And, and, there's probably a hand of Fatima somewhere in there. <laughs> or a hand of fate. Um, Manos. The monkey uh, paw. Yeah. Uh, and this is where he reveals that he is—he's uh, on the run. Uh, yeah. He just—he just doesn't want to get involved in any of these countries. Um, it's thus hinted that he is not actually from either of these countries. Um, he's from somewhere else, um, and uh, just kind of ended up here. Um, um, but he gets a great idea. Um, you know, he insists that Sophie go in his place as his mother. Now, here's my question. What do you think is Howell's actual play here? Because he knows that Sophie's going to get found out immediately. Like, he, he can't yeah. really believe this is going to work. So is this all just a pretense to get to kind of throw Solomon off her game, do you think? Yes, yes and no. Mm. It, it almost feels like, this is going to sound terrible, but mm. it almost feels like he's putting Sophie in front of Solomon mm. so that this, hey, this, this person who's claiming to be my mother is this woman who, you know, is with me, mm -hmm. not, you know, either yeah. physically in the house or in love with. Yeah. And, you know, this is the thing that's going on, Solomon. Yeah. And that that's what's putting yeah. her off. It's not, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's any part of Solomon being like, I didn't know he had a mother. Right. No, <laughs> no I think no, it's no. entirely <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, remember when we had something? Well, now she's the new person I have something with. So it's like, now you've got Suleiman like, uh, okay, what's going on? How, how, what's happening with this? <laughs> yeah. And the fact that Suleiman... In a childish, died. childish kind of way. Right, absolutely. Just the way the howl is. Right. <clears throat> um, but also showing him somebody who is also cursed. So Suleiman realizing it's not just that he's fallen in with a random girl. Like, right. there's a lot going on here. <laughs> yeah. And so I can't just, you know, have her thrown off a, a ledge somewhere. Right. Um... But yeah, and so off she goes. Um, um, and you get this rather extended sequence of, uh, of uh, Sophie going for her audience uh, with the king. Um, excuse me. And of course, more animation, all kinds oh, of things going on, movement, constant gosh. stuff, colors. Yeah. I'm like, damn. <laughs> we just can't stop it. Um, uh, and then in comes the Witch of the Waste. Um, uh, who doesn't quite fit into her box, but you know. Um, and I, I do love the implication here that like it's not she's not uncomfortable, right? She's not like cramming herself into this box. 
It's just it doesn't need to be that big for her to fit inside. It's it's a, it's a TARDIS basically. Yeah. Um. And but she she can't handle the light. Um. So she she's blocking herself there. Um. Uh. And then up they go. Um. And again, this is kind of one of those things where um, what I think folks don't get is that um, um, the Witch of the Wastes. Um, it's not that you know she's not struggling because she's old. She's struggling because she's in the sun. Um, yeah. This whole thing is to weaken her as she is going up the stairs. Um, this is also where we discover that Heat is actually a person, not a dog. Yeah. Um, because he weighs as much as a person. <laughs> yeah, watching Sophie pick him up, <laughs> she's like, oh, boy. <laughs> like, oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, full props to... I don't know maybe if it was Miyazaki you know, writing this dialogue like word for word or whether it's kind of evolved over time. But the whole, you know, uh, give me a hand. If only I were younger. Gosh, it would be great. If, you know, man, I could, uh, you, <laughs> yeah. <know. laughs> you hadn't done to this me, you jerk. Yeah. <laughs> this would have been fine. And she gets up to the top and, uh, you know, uh, she comes up and, boy, you look old now. Um <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Um, and uh, yeah, in they come. Um, and uh, um, uh, Sophie is led away while the uh, light bulbs are switched on. Um, and again, yeah. kind of that implication of we have a more <clears throat> science, technology driven sort of society um, to create these, these lights, um, which then. Um, well, a thing happens <laughs> to her. Yeah. Uh, well, you um, know that the lights reminded me of. Have you ever seen the hieroglyphic where it's the Amarna light bulb? Mm-hmm. Um, it it looks like a light bulb. Okay. It's probably yeah. not, but yeah. it's like a lotus blossom and this kind of weird thing. Yeah, and cool. The claim is if you you know uh, watch a- ancient aliens, <laughs> it's like oh this is proof that you know the Egyptians had electricity and this is a light bulb and it looks lo- looks like a light no, <laughs> but it's like those that's what these light bulbs even though you know it's like an Edison bulb yeah, yeah it yeah. reminded me of that kind of thing because mm-hmm. it's that it's a mundane item yep but it achieves a magical end mm-hmm. like the Amarna light bulb if it ah, was truly a yeah, light bulb yeah would have been an amazing magical type of development for the Egyptians. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. like, aha, I see the kind of nexus between the Edison bulb and this Amarna thing where you're yeah. using the, the simple for a magical purpose. I'm like, I gotcha. Yep. I gotcha. Here. Totally. Um, I also appreciate the sort of, um, um, uh, how they show the sort of shadow creatures appearing around the Witch of the Wastes. Yeah. Um, um, which, you know, we will then see in a few moments, but kind of like, here's what it looks like when somebody's power is being drained away. Yeah. Um, this is clever. Um, and then, um, yeah, Sophie comes in to meet with Solomon. Um, and um, let's see here. Um, yeah, and then in comes uh, Witch of the Wastes, all wasted. <laughs> wasted away if you will wasted away um, uh, yeah and then you know the king shows up um, fun the real day. king or the not yeah. real king <laughs> exactly um, really a very um, sort of Cagliostro-esque um, you know uh, as in uh, Count Cagliostro uh, sort of, sort yeah. of character you know, really blustery um, but I think to your point, John, I think this is also all part of the plan. That this is how I was saying, I was summoned, I showed up. <laughs> I'm here now, so I've technically done my duty, I can leave. Yeah, I've, I've responded to the, to the uh, summons. I don't, I don't need to deal with this anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and you didn't expose me to your light bulb trick, so we're all good. Yeah. <laughs> hey, neat. Um, but no, Solomon will, uh, will not have that. Um, Okada believe, Okada says that he likes to see Solomon as essentially Muska from Castle in the Sky. Um, okay. She is this you know, very power hungry, calm, you know, uh, collected and very calculating character. 
Um, and I think it, it definitely tracks uh, with what she does here. Um, as she tries to uh, take out Hal. Um, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Indeed. Um, and so, yeah, Hal begins to transform. We know that's bad. Um, and then off they fly away with, again, more a ridiculously gorgeous animation. Yeah. Um, uh, we get the rings as they, they fly off there. Um, and I love, you know, you get this... It's such an interesting transformation of the Witch of the Waste. Yeah. Where you go from, why is this, you know, grotesque woman doing this to, to Sophie? What's yeah. going on? To, she gets her powers drained. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can actually, it actually feels like you can feel the malice towards her drain away. Yeah. Because now when they're mm -hmm. flying, and she's just a doddering little old blob. <laughs> it's just like... You know, she's actually a nice character like this. Yeah, <laughs> like absolutely. She's a little weird, a little <laughs> little goofy looking, but yeah. you know, wow, you you drained the malice away from it, and now she's like this nice little character. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Not what I would have thought. Um, no, not what I was expecting. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> you know, the first, I think the first time I saw it when those lights went on, I was expecting the "I'm melting, I'm <laughs> melting, I'm melting." Be like, oh wow, you killed her. Like, mm -hmm. nope, you just made her a nice doddering old lady. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so off they fly. Um, let's talk for a second about all the page boys. <clears throat> that look exactly like Howl. Mm. Mm. What did I say about a woman scored? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think Solomon has a, has a thing. Um. And I think they had a thing. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Totally. Um. So, uh, yeah, so with that many page boys, you think she was a congressman? Ah. <laughs> just, um, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Sophie flies back over her hometown, and this is where I think uh, really one of the big themes of this movie is returning. Um, you know, coming back to things after after time. We should definitely see this this uh, here where we're now. Gee, how far into the movie are we? Um, halfway, about halfway. Uh, a little over halfway, and already that town feels alien. Um, yeah. yeah. It feels like she's left that behind, and she may never see it again. Um, it's really cool. Um, I don't think they're children. I think they are... Um, they are... Images of Howl. I think she has created them to look like Howl. Yeah, they're magical constructs. Yeah, that, that's what I suspect. Um, Which, I mean, think of the again witch of the waste mm -hmm. she has her blobby guys yep mm -hmm. that do things mm -hmm. so it's like Suleiman easily could you know whip up a batch of howl pages yeah exactly <laughs> what one yeah. fell off the roof let's yeah. make another 10 exactly yeah <laughs> whatever um it's actually a bit that's actually a, a, a Japanese myth thing if I is an agi is an ami um uh, but yeah and so uh, Sophie comes back home um, uh, spends the night, uh, and, um, and, you know, Miyazaki toying with our hearts again, uh, cause Sophie gets up and starts walking around and she's not old. And yeah. you're like, oh, like, obviously the curse isn't broken, but has something happened? Like, can she come back? Um, uh, and then, uh, and of course we realize that it's a dream. Um, as she sort of walks into Howl's heart, and I love the the image of like ventricles in here. And she's like walking yeah. through the ventricles of the heart um, that are full of children's toys, of course. Um, it's called plaque. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Hal, you got to stop eating the bacon, man. You're really yeah. getting a lot of problem there. Fatty, fatty uh, corpuscles. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, I also think it's interesting that we never see this monster version of Howl. At his worst, he never looks as bad. Um, yeah. And so I wonder if this is what Howell fears he's going to turn into, or whether this is like Sophie's imagining of his most monstrous form. Because I don't think this is actually what he would look like necessarily. Um, I think this is just kind of a uh, you know kind of a dream version of yeah. that. 
Well, I mean, given that she doesn't really, she has no concept of how bad it could be. Mm-hmm. This, yeah. this, you know, may well, may well be wandering off into the, what's the worst thing that could be? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. This is what we think this could be if it was the terrible yeah. outcome. So. Yeah. Um, um, uh, but he gets cleaned up. Um, and, and again, she's a little younger now. Um, she's standing up straight. Um, she's kind of found a little place. Again, she's more, more 50 years old now than 90. Yeah. Um, but she's kind of found her place and she's doing her thing. Um, out comes the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the flitter. Um, in a scene that, again, I think is a little bit of Miyazaki showing off of, well, I'll just spend a couple minutes with this scene. <laughs> yeah. Showing this happen. Okay. Um, fun scene. Not bad. But um, uh, you definitely get this sense of a family forming, though. Yeah. Um, as they get together. Um, They're working together. That's, you know, similar goal. You got mm-hmm. super grandma being looked after <laughs> by somewhat, like, middle-aged lady <laughs> exactly um and then uh howl shows up full of him and vigor um and notably with black hair yep um he's no longer n- no more dye job for him and that is i think a really effective symbol to the audience uh as he says a little moment you know in this scene i'm tired of running um it's gonna time for him to to do a thing um well, it's also time to put away childish things. Yes, exactly. You know what I mean? So it's like he's not the dying your hair is childish. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was his rebelliousness mm-hmm. and his like rock star lifestyle. <laughs> now he's gonna he's getting a little bit a little bit more buttoned down. Mm-hmm. Exactly. A little more more sure. Um, I want to talk about the uh, the chalk machine. Um, straight out of like a nineteen twenties Japanese high school. Um, that they yeah. use to lay down the chalk line for the magic circle. Because um, again, I think or that is that very they lay down for Taisho baseball girls. Well, yeah, I mean, totally. And, and I think again, that is kind of a, a little bit of a hint of that there is a certain, you know, um, crossing of the the magical kind of uh, of, uh, of the, the timelines here a little bit, maybe. That you know, where is he possibly pulling this from? Because it sure doesn't look like something from from this this part of the world you know yeah um who knows um although great i guess you'd have you know cricket fields and such in uh well i mean you could have baseball yeah it's true you know it's full, full on yeah. full on baseball team so this yeah, is easily yeah. a line painter from a baseball yeah. you know diamond good point so um, is miyazaki a big baseball fan um I, I suspect he's as much a baseball fan as anyone in japan which means significant <laughs> so this might be that I yep. love baseball. Here's the mm-hmm. here's the little baseball thing. Yeah, huh, cool. Um, uh, yeah, and so he he reforms the house, and again, this is why we watch fantasy films. Is for sequences like this of the house just literally yeah. shaping and new rooms melding yeah. out. It's gorgeous. Uh, and I think it's also one of those things that, G- that Ghibli can do so well because they are so good at rendering, you know. Just a homey home environment. Yeah. Um, so it's not just seeing this house. It's that when it's done, you're like, oh, I want to live there. Um, and they're back home. Um, and, oh, boy. How. Um, how he put his foot in his mouth <laughs> with giving Sophie her old room. <sighs> because you can totally see it from his perspective of I'm going to give you a taste of home. You know, you're you're far away from everything. It's a bit of nostalgia. And she's like, "This is not what I wanted." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goody, back to drudgery. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no, that's not what's going on. Hal, come on, man. What are you oh, doing? <laughs> um, but it should be pointed out, like throughout this entire sequence, like she's 15 again. Basically, um, or she's maybe you know in her twenties, um, but she's definitely much younger, um, especially as they go around in the uh, um, in the again absurdly gorgeously rendered <laughs> fields. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, and I've got to give Miyazaki and Sophie full credit here. 
that she realizes what's going on, and I did not realize what was going on in this scene um, until she said it, that Howell is saying goodbye. Um, that he's setting all this up to say, and here are all the things so you all are safe and, and happy and okay. It's like, yeah. Oh. Right. Yeah. The doors don't go all the same places anymore. They go nice places and safe places. Yeah. Like, oh, boy. Um, and I love it that he never he doesn't deny it, right? Like, he, he's not going to lie to her. Um, um, but I, obviously, I don't think it's, it's his intention to go off and die or anything. But he's like, right. you know, yeah. Um, and she gets old again because what's happening now. Now she's thinking about herself. She's thinking about... You know, the implications for her. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, Airship shows up. Um, uh, very, very Miyazaki, or very Nausicaa Airship, actually, now that I'm looking at it. Um, and so he has all to, the bombs and everything. Um, <sighs> yep. Um, with a very, let's be honest, very sort of... Uh, the line uh, the, 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 the the lines of uh, which side is it on does it really matter um, I mean boy isn't that sort of a Miyazaki Takahata kind of a, a line yeah <laughs> it's bringing death and destruction does it really matter who's mm-hmm. yep. the, the causer of it it's still going to cause death and destruction yep totally um, uh, to quote Doctor Who um, um, no matter how much you're sure you were right, you never know whose children will burn. Oof. Yes. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, uh, the doctor gets serious at times. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and then, obviously, you know, we, uh, we learned that she's in love, which didn't really surprise us. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then, yeah, Mother shows up. Again, not really too much to say about the scene other than we all kind of know what's going on. We suspect it's probably, you know, Solomon in disguise. Um, actually not, but still something being left. And um, again, I do really appreciate the, the reveal here. That the Witch of the Waste is old, but that doesn't mean she doesn't remember anything. Yeah. <laughs> And so she opens the thing and oh yeah, no 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 no, chucking that out. Here you go, Casper. <laughs> nope. <laughs> she knows what's going on. Um. Um. See, yeah, and then the very sweet moment between her and Marco of, uh, you know, please don't go away. I love you. Um, and she decides, she agrees to stay. Um, as we move into the third act. Uh, or the sixth act, I don't know, in this movie. <laughs> There's a lot of stages. Home stretch? Yeah, there we go. Um, um, as uh, the bombs begin to drop, um, and it gets serious. Um, again, very, you know, obviously very much, you know, sort of World War II imagery here in terms yeah. of, uh, um, you know, firebombing, basically. Um and so, let's see here. Um, Hal goes away to fight. Um, uh, Sophie is left here. Um, and she does the smart thing. She's like, we have to disconnect from everything to protect us. So we have to, you know, disconnect everything uh, by taking out Calcifer. Um, which, sure enough, kind of destroys the castle. Yep. Um, and then um, they go back in, try to restart it. Um, and uh, Sophie again, back to her old self. Um, now that she's thinking about the people, trying to deal with that stuff. Um, uh, he gets the braid, the, uh, the castle sort of reforms, kind of, sort of, mostly, kind of. <laughs> Functionally, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Much we do. Um, as off they go. And then we find out where Howell's heart is. And again, this is just such lovely filmmaking. Um, It's obvious when you think about it. Um, There are probably audience members who figured this out before this point. Um, But it just makes a a lovely little little notification and a lovely little little moment. And then 
the fact that it's it doesn't really matter whether you didn't realize this up until this point. It's the fact that the witch realizes it and then uses this as a time to go, okay, I'm going to grab the heart. Yeah. Which is bad. Um, and so Sophie does the thing, and again, good callback, where she splashes cows for the water the way she <laughs> <laughs> threatened to. Um, and... Everything falls apart, literally. Um, uh, and so she's left with the ring, finds the door, goes through the door, um, and finds herself in the um, uh, the, uh, the the hut. Um, I find it interesting and kind of kind of uh, a neat sort of storytelling kind of magic thing that it doesn't connect to the door um, of the hut anymore like that door should just open onto the field but because right. all the magic has been sort of messed up there's now this sort of tunnel between the two um which i think is, is, a, is a good bit of, of storytelling but i want to call this out again something that okada pointed out um the notes on the table okay with a battleship on it. Um, How hates war. Why would he have a battleship paperweight? Okada believes this is not Howell's paperweight, nor his notes, because if you read the, whatever Italian it is, it's act, or I, actually, I, I think this is a, I mentioned like in the storyboards or something. This is a draft of a magical scroll thing some some magical document hmm. okada believes this is something that howells like uncle wrote but he was killed um and that that is what essentially kicked off howell being sort of drafted into the magic academy um and put under like solomon's you know tutelage, tutelage exactly um Hmm. there was other stuff going on with his family that kind of sucked him into all the politics and so forth. Um, Interesting. Which would kind of make sense that why this 10-year-old boy is being pulled into all these things and has all this kind of uh, um, these things going on. Who knows, though? Um, uh, yeah, and so she comes out um, and, again, how is now 10 or so. Um, and we see the moment uh, where he makes a deal with Calcifer. Um And... Yeah. Which I was trying to figure out, like, in this world, mm -hmm. just random spirits drop from the sky at certain times? You know, it's like, did we yeah. have a reasonable explanation as to why <laughs> here, right now? I don't, think, I don't know, yeah. You know? Um, it's just like, that's kind of weird. I always assumed that this was a magical <laughs> place. Like, you know, how, it wasn't just a random retreat area, right? That right. Howell chose an area that had some magical connection. Uh, and so this is a thing that is more likely to happen there. Right. Spirits are more likely to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it should also be pointed out, like, these spirits are dying. Like, we see one of them yeah. hit the water and then just sink and down to the bottom and, and fade away. Yeah. Um, so the implication to me is that Howell, like, sees this thing and is essentially saving its life. Um, by talking to it and so forth, um, and then giving it its heart, or his heart. And but picking up a burning meteorite. Oh, exactly. this is neat. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm on fire. fire. <laughs> um, and so crucially, uh, Sophie sees this and she she cries out, "Howl, Calcifer! I figured it out. Find me." And goes out. So. Sophie names Calcifer. Yeah. Um, and that's what Howell hears. Because uh, we do see him turn to see her momentarily. Yeah. So there's definitely some connection through time. As the ring then breaks and she loses mm -hmm. her connection to him. Yep. Yep. So yeah. Wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. <laughs> um, and and, and uh, back she comes and... I really loved the, the dialogue here, the choice of words here, 
um, I was watching the English dub, um, yeah. where she sees him and um, kisses him and then says, um, if you can, I need you to take me to council for now. And I just love that, that permission, that, that asking that, 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 you know, if you're not up for this, I get it, but this is what needs to happen now. Um, and it's just a, a wonderfully, like, it's not commanding, but it is kind of directive of, you're kind of out of yourself. I'm not trying to push you beyond your limits, but we need to do this now. I know you're a giant bird thing <laughs> with one big foot. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's tough, but I just need this little extra something from you, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and off they go. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, in the, in the worst moment, um, and so of course she manages to get the, the, the heart back from the witch, um, puts it back inside him, um, and again, I, I do kind of appreciate that she, she does, like, talk to Calisfer and say, I, th this might kill you, I hope it doesn't, <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like, are we all okay with this? Like, does this seem like the right choice to make? He's like, yeah, I think this is good. Um, <laughs> well, I, f I find that you get to this point in the film, mm -hmm. and you just have, you ratchet up the affection mm -hmm. in such an interesting way. When she yeah. asked Hal to do the one more thing, yeah. she is very intimately with him in that place and time. When she goes, gets the heart back from the witch, yeah. she kisses her on the cheek. It's like yeah. you have this incredible, you know, growth in this personal intimacy yeah. between Sophie and every one of these people. Great point. And it's just like, wow, okay, you're you're hitting, you're now you're getting to the end, and you're getting this emotional crescendo that yeah. is like building. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh. great call out. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, and in she goes, pressing the heart into his body, um, in a very sort of Beauty and the Beast sort of a moment. Um, as everything falls apart, uh, yeah. that, one, that one final moment, um, uh, and then uh, uh, she, uh, uh, oh yeah, and then uh, I, I love how the um, how Turnip Head kind of sacrifices himself a bit for them, you know, yeah. pushes himself in front. And you see the stick fall, and you're oh Turnip Head, and then she kisses him, and uh, he turns into um, into Crispin Freeman for some reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Who did voice this character? And I, I do have to pause because this is an awesome story. Um, so, whoever does the dubs, uh, the Disney dubs for Ghibli movies, they always manage to get at least one notable anime voice actor into, into every Ghibli movie. Okay. Um, just if you look at the credits, like, oh, you know, cool, that person, that person, that person. Uh, Washu is in is in Princess Mononoke. Um, just fun stuff like that. Um, and so Christian Freeman was was brought in to do Turnip Head. And obviously he has like three lines. Yeah. Um, so Crispin talks about how he was. Uh, they booked him for half an hour. He's like, all right. And so he comes in and you know Disney lot, you know, very prestigious, goes in and he realizes the engineers on staff aren't the ones that hired him. They're just the engineers. They don't know him from Adam. <laughs> so he walks in and they're used to dealing with, you know, teeny bopper ABC TV kids who right. come in to dub a Ghibli film and have no idea what they're doing. So he comes in and they're like, okay, so you'll sit down and it'll be like three beeps. And he goes, yeah, I know. Yeah, I believe me, I know. Like okay, all right, fine. And so he sits down, beep beep beep, do 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 do. Just nails it first time. And there's this pause. You go, oh, you do know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, that must be so much fun. <laughs> so you got done in three minutes and spent the next like twenty five minutes just talking about Studio Ghibli movies with all the engineers there. Oh, wow. 
because uh, he's like, yeah, I, I can do this. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm comfortable with this, this particular job. Um, this ain't my first rodeo, boys. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, you want a Audi card? I'll give you some Audi card. Um, so, um, uh, uh, yeah, so we, we get our, our ending, um, um, as we discovered that, uh, first off, Heat is, uh, uh, a little smarter than perhaps we thought, maybe a little Ein in him there, mm -hmm. um, as he, he gets it on. Interestingly, in the Japanese, um, Solomon calls him, um, like, uh, you unfaithful servant? Yes. Um, um, unfaithful, like... Not traitorous, unfaithful in the sense of like, of like a lover. So you wonder if maybe there's kind of a that you know, kind of like Howell, like there is some something between the two of them, and she turned him into a dog. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, gotcha. Uh, yeah, and then you see Turnip Head go off, and here's again where we we realize okay, Heat is a wizard. Uh, you know, the prince was also a wizard, clearly, uh, from this wizard kingdom. Uh, and so, basically, everyone we see in this shot is a wizard, <laughs> so, or a witch, in some way, shape, or form. Um, except they're for, all magical. They're all <laughs> magical, exactly. Except for Sophie, for now. Uh, and, yeah, and then, as we mentioned, Solomon says, eh, let's end the war. Um, probably because we're losing very badly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and we get our, uh, Okada says the, the exact opposite ending of Laputa, where, you know, Castle in the Sky, um, Miyazaki makes this big point about, oh, we don't need floating castles, we need to be down on the earth, we'll be happier if we're on the earth and, and yeah. tilling the soil, and now, no, 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 we're happier up in the air, flying through, you know, <laughs> yeah. as happy wizards and witches, whatever. Um... Uh, yeah, and so you see um, everyone hanging out, and then um, I was mentioning this to John earlier. Um, see that little flag, like right up there, the little yellow and green flag. Yep. <sighs> Turns out, um, apples and an, an orchard is a Japanese pun for um, basically other country or strange country. So the implication is that that is the the room for Turniped. That, you know, that he's yeah. living in that room, but Miyazaki didn't want to be like that cheesy and show literally everybody in the final shot, so he just put it in there to, 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 to hint at it. I don't know. <laughs> um... But, uh, yeah, but we do get um, our lovely shot of everyone uh, hanging out in the, their beautiful uh, new flying castle, castle, flying home. castle, um, as they're all playing. Which, around. if you think Calcifer had trouble making hot water. Yeah. How in the heck is he making this thing flop? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is that extra could effort. be easy. Um, no. As we pointed out in the final shot, again, we were talking about this before, um, this is actually sometime in the future. Um, because we see this shot of ships flying over the countryside, but we saw earlier the countryside being burned. So th this is clearly sometime in the future, and those are not like, at, like those are warships. Like that is a fleet heading out to war. So another war is on the offing, basically World War Two. That was World War One. Yeah. Um, you know the cycle continues. Um, it's kind of the hint there, because um, Miyazaki just can't kind of leave that well enough alone, if you will. Uh, Story-wise, um, we do get this this lovely shot of uh, Sophie and Howell, and something's changed. Um, the ribbon in Sophie's hair or Sophie's hat is black, just like Howell's hair, just like um, the witches, which are the waist clothes. Just like Kiki. Um, the implication being that Sophie is now a witch as well. Uh, oh, maybe a full-scale witch. Give me everything else that's going on. And her original uh, abilities. But, yeah, it's a very romantic ending. Yes. Point, John. Um, full, full romance, full Harlequin romance ending, I think, here. 
Was that all you needed was for, you know, I'm king of the world or whatever the heck that was from Titanic. <laughs> yeah. That's all you needed in this scene. It was like, oh, that's just mm-hmm. gorgeous. Definitely. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's, it's odd. I mean, it, this is probably the only Miyazaki movie with this kind of, dare I say it, sappy of an ending. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not complaining, but it's just, it's just interesting that it's a, just a happy ending. I mean, obviously, war is on the offing because, you know, we got to do that. <laughs> right. Um, but, yeah, she's, she, she's with the love of her life, with her family, you know, flying through the clouds, um, happily ever after. Yeah. And that's a little unsettling. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, it just does wrap up like that, where you're like, yeah. okay, yeah. like, is there a part two where, like, <laughs> something terrible happens? Yeah. Where we see where those battle battle um, balloons are going to, and what terrible things are going to result from that. But, mm-hmm. <clears throat> nope, it just kind of ends here. Yeah, yeah. Which it left me the same feeling watching time number two as it did from time number one, which mm-hmm. I got to the end of it was like, well, that was a nice Ghibli film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, I, I'm not really entirely sure that I would if somebody was like if I was going to watch one Ghibli film what would it be mm-hmm. I, yeah. I like this I, I think it's nice I think it was beautifully rendered I think mm-hmm. you know a lot of effort was done and a lot of time and love was put into the animation of it but I wouldn't mm-hmm. say necessarily that the story drove me to being wowed yeah. mm-hmm. I hate to say that I mean, yeah. I do, but... yeah. no. and I, there are people who, uh, where it does and I, I totally get that um, you know, it, it is a, um, I can see it, it, it is kind of a tone poem, um, it is kind of just a, a thing to sit back and just let all of the things wash over you, um, and just experience it, it is, it is a gorgeous experience as that, um, but it definitely didn't connect with me the way it, uh, other Miyazaki movies uh, connect with me, um, and again, part of that could be, you know, Miyazaki coming into a project that he didn't initially intend to take on right um and um uh, and you know that's just how, how it, it, it turned out i don't know so yeah um that will do it i'm gonna take a quick break for just a few minutes and we'll be back to talk about more modern anime and the latest anime news be right Ooh. back